Thank you again, Sanya, for inviting me. Uh, and yes, and as Sanya mentioned, I am the um, Professor of Printmaking and Publishing at the Kunstskolen, which is the Oslo National Academy of the Arts in Norway. So you can probably hear from my accent, I'm British and I've been working here in Norway for the last seven years. And as part of my position, I have a research time um, and we've been developing artistic research here, uh, which has now opened up to a third tier for PhDs. Um, so those of you who may be new to uh, artistic research as a sort of an extension of an artist practice, hopefully this might be of interest to you. Um, so I, I had, did do, a, as I mentioned, I did a recording of this just in case. So I know for sure that this is a 30 minute lecture. And I've got about 30 slides to show you. And then there's a summary at the end, just as a reminder. Um, the methodology of my artistic practice embodies David Pye's first-hand account of the workmanship of risk. And the project integrates CNC milling to overcome process limitations, to realize scalable, complex, multi-block relief prints, and to allow further exploration in color printing. Um, this presentation reflects on the process of transforming reduction relief prints into tessellating multi-block relief prints, as well as commenting on the situation and timescale in which the research took place. The outcome delivers new insights into my artistic practice, and uh, if uh, there are any questions, you are welcome to ask those at the end of the presentation. Um, David Pye published The Nature and Art of Workmanship to advocate for diversity in the material nature of the craft process. In the workmanship of certainty, the result of every operation during production has been predetermined and is outside of the control of the operative once production starts. In the workmanship of risk, the result of every operation during production is determined by the workman as he works, and its outcome depends wholly or largely on his care judgment and dexterity. Unlike his contemporaries, Pye was writing from his everyday experience in the workshop as a practicing craftsman and an artistic researcher, even before the term was coined. Craft theorist Glenn Adam Adamson quoted that he systematically dismantled the ideas of John Ruskin's art and craft movement, which he found to be insupportably idealistic. Pye argued, for example, that Ruskin did not realize there could be great pleasure in doing highly regulated workmanship, as perhaps he never had to work for a living, and that a fair proportion of patient tedious work is necessary if one is to take pleasure in any kind of livelihood. Adams Adamson claims that Pye perhaps was the most widely read 20th century craft theorist and he's still quoted today by educators, historians, and anthropologists, including Christopher Frayling, Ezra Shales, Tim Ingold, Daniel Miller, and John Thackeray. However, although Pye recognized the privilege of opportunity when the use of talent can only be learned very slowly by practice, he did not attempt to contextualize the craft process further by advocating for diversity of gender, class, or race of the workman. In 1968, hands-on work remained divided between men in the workshop and women in the home. Influential art theorists were principally white European men and post-colonial discourse for public engagement had yet to evolve. 50 years later, what practice-led methods embody the workman in her artistic research? How can the workman remain open to the risks that make interpretation possible? when unforeseen constraints take hold. By positioning myself as a printmaker in the 21st century, this project invites further reflections on Pi's workmanship of certainty versus workmanship of risk. My artistic practice takes inspiration from post-industrial craft heritage and is situated in the intersection of tacit knowledge, machine tools, and digital technology. As an exploration into mankind's pursuit to manipulate and control the natural environment, my polychromatic, gesturally carved relief prints 
depict vernacular topiary as a common trait of urban sprawl. In seeking to reveal embedded knowledge, my research methodology purposefully aimed to include the following five stages. To identify by gathering visual data from observation, accessing primary source material, and reading relevant publications in the field. To select by translating collated data into drawing, carving, and printing a reduction relief matrix by hand in the studio. To process by digitally tracing, tessellating, and mimicking with CNC routing in the workshop. To analyze by remixing multi-relief matrices in the print studio, and to reflect on the art production in a written report. In 2017, I began recording visual information of ornamental foliage in Nordstrand, a district of Oslo located on the south side of the fjord, in which property boundaries are commonly delineated by manicured hedges and picket fences. Tuya, green giant conifer, is a hybrid cross between two Japanese and North American species. And as a non-native evergreen, it is extensively cultivated for urban development throughout Norway. I worked on plein air by drawing with charcoal on paper mounted to an easel. The sketches were relatively quick, spontaneous, and although self-conscious, were valued for their binary data. Gestural marks captured a rhythm in the repetition, a direction of movement, and a sense of scale relative to my body. The foliage was also photographed with a smartphone camera which proved less conspicuous and completed in less time and added to the accumulation of visual data. I began by reinterpreting the binary and visual data, drawing with graphite transferred onto linoleum matrix in preparation for carving. At this point, I was aware that Pi's workmanship of risk could be applied to two different stages. Firstly, preparatory, when hand carving the matrix, and secondly, productive, when color mixing ink by eye during the printing process. Historically, Japanese yukayo artists rarely carved or printed their own multi-block woodcuts. Production was traditionally divided between carvers and printers, all masters with specialist knowledge of material, tools, and techniques. In comparison, reduction relief printing demands the full attention of the artist to engage with every stage of production, including carving the block and printing the edition. The irrevocability of this printmaking process means that at any moment, whether through inattention or inexperience or accident, the artist is liable to ruin the job. So to reduce the risk, craftsmanship follows the mantra of practice makes perfect. The workman is compelled to dedicate hours refining her skills through repetitive acts of hand-eye coordination so that the muscle memory becomes embodied as tacit knowledge. This is echoed in Richard Sennett's The Craftsman, an essential tenet in the art and craft department at Oslo National Academy of the Arts, observing that 10,000 hours is a common touchstone for how long it takes to become an expert. Our workshops are open 18 hours a day, seven days a week for students to become specialists of their art production. To reference from primary source material, I also visit the Munch Salon and National Museum. Edward Munch, uh, who lived between 1863 and 1944, was a titan of an artist during his lifetime. His presence still dominates the cultural landscape of Norway, and the impact of his legacy attracts, world, attracts visitors worldwide to the museum's collection. My research became a unique opportunity to explore Nordic light and color through Munch's paintings. I selected Munch's Death in a Sick Room, painted in 1893, initially for its graphical square format and distinct contours of color. But subconsciously, I was also drawn to the figure's isolation in the painting. After relocating the previous year from London, 
I was reading from the fallout over Brexit and haunted by the sickly green skin pallor of monks' figures. I frequently encountered this eerie colour in winter during the early morning when the sunlight reflected off Nordstrand's white wooden villas. The painting was photographed with a smartphone and colour matched by eye with a Pantone swatch book. The secondary source material contributed to the visual data and served as an accurate colour palette to reference on my return to the print studio. My contractual time at the Kunstskolen is divided between teaching, administration and artistic research. However, I am rarely able to commit to a daily exercise of hand carving and colour mixing in the workshop. So initially, I was critical of my own results when compared to Pai's art of workmanship. My prints lacked diversity in scale, gesture or colour. And in my mind's eye, they were either too flat in regularity, too conventional in form or too contrived in intention. I was compelled to reevaluate the gathered visual data. I began to explore photo montage by removing the camera lens perspective to convey a movement through space. The result was a digital composite produced in Adobe Photoshop. The image was gray scaled, gridded and reversed and displayed on a mini tablet as visual notation during the hand carving stage. Reduction relief printing is a process applied to a single matrix by progressively alternating between printing and carving the matrix, the ink is rolled onto the raised surface and printed in registration over the previous printed layer to achieve a multicolor image. Carving the block by hand stimulates a haptic sensation and the ensuing marks range from a gestural and spontaneous indentation to a more controlled and deliberate sculptural formation. When applied to reduction relief printing, the process supports polychromatic combinations varying in tone, hue and luminosity. The printmaker's creative development is activated from within the production, like a painter applying paint to a canvas. The reduction relief matrix was 45 by 45 centimetres, a scale for my body to comfortably enfold, to gesturally rotate and hand carve at 360 degrees. A strategy of trial and error developed my confidence and reacquainted my hands with tacit knowledge. I proceeded to alternate between carving and printing, enabling a readjustment back into the familiar rhythm of working by hand-eye coordination. Contrary to the custom rules of dedicated practice, third time lucky was a more fitting methodology, producing a multicolor reduction relief print that reflected Pi's art of workmanship. In July 2018, uh, I gave birth. My body was tangibly committed to keeping a human being alive. My mind was reorientated towards new priorities and my time was overloaded by a round the clock routine, never knowing when I could return to the print studio. My hands were delegated to new tasks, performing repetitive acts of childcare and domestic chores. Only my eyes could remain focused, randomly capturing visual data in my locale, occasionally visiting exhibitions and sporadically absorbing reading material. Confidence in my own artistic practice began to wane and the 18 month hiatus began, became an endurance exercise in self-determination. But then it returned to the point at which it had stopped. To compensate for the time out and the growing self-doubt of my workmanship, I initially focused on processes with predetermined outcomes. It was at this point that I was aware of Pi's workmanship of certainty that could be applied to two different stages Firstly, preparatory in the post-production of digital files, and secondly, productive in the CNC routing of multiple relief, multiple relief blocks. Historically, craft-based industries have often relied on hybrid forms of production in which some of the operations have predetermined results, 
whilst others depend on the care, judgment and dexterity of the workmen. The production is commonly divided between a team of operators with specialist knowledge of materials, tools and technology. In comparison, a hybrid art practice demands full attention of the artist when integrating new technology into, into traditional craft processes. The digital embodiment of printmaking process means that comprehensive knowledge and experience is demanded of the artist to complete the job. For example, due to the size constraint of an A3 Epson scanner, each print layer of the reduction process was digital, digitally translated in part as bitmap files. Post-production in Adobe Photoshop involved transforming to realign the bitmap files back into one layer, posterizing to reduce the number of tones to vectorize, and overlaying to check the digital realignment of the bitmap layers. In addition, due to the RAM limitations of my computer hardware to auto trace and vector magic, each layer of the bitmap file was translated in parts as vector files. Post-production in Adobe Illustrator involved transforming to realign the vector files back into one layer, erasing to reduce the number of stray nodes and overlaying to check the digital realignment of the vector layers. Vector Magic's tracing software is a programming structure that performs a series of, series of actions as sequences, selections, and iterations in a specific order. Similarly, Artlandia, sorry, Artlandia Symmetry Works is a software component that automates the tessellation process in Adobe Illustrator, and in theory saves hours of work and painstaking effort. I dedicated time to learning this plugin during the post-production stage, but after ample testing, I concluded that the multi-layered vector file was too complex for the programming structure to calculate. Without the software to automate a series of actions, I had to become embedded in the programming structure. I committed hours of work and painstaking effort of human computer interaction to perform multiple sequences, selections and iterations by hand-eye coordination. By overlapping two sides of the composition in Adobe Illustrator to erase or exude the vector paths in pattern editing mode, a strategy of trial and error produced a multi-layered isagonal tessellation with a half drop repeat. In Crafting the Digital, a research paper published in 2017, David Grimshaw described the CNC router as a machine tool located at the convergence of processes that can be understood to be at once manual, mechanical, and digital. In the workshop at Oslo National Academy of the Arts, an operative oversees the computer-aided design modeling with McNeil Rhino 3D, and the machine milling on a multi-cam CNC router 3000 series. With precision of the workmanship of certainty, the operative imports the vector paths into RhinoCam, a CNC plugin that programs the tooling and conversion into tool paths. The post-processor software component then generates the G-code instructions, including the XYZ coordinates which are exported to a multi-cam job console for the CNC router to follow. Once production begins, it is outside of the control of the operative. The reduction relief matrix was initially hand carved at a 30 degrees horizontal direction with a Japanese komasuki gouge shaped in a U. However, the CNC router was programmed to mimic the surface of the matrix by high speed milling at a 90 degree vertical direction with a tool bit shaped in a V. By virtue of the exacting work and as a precaution to the material limitations of the matrix, it was necessary to laminate the linoleum onto MDF for the following reasons. To prevent slippage on the CNC router vacuum bed, 
to avoid weakening the scaffolding when milling and to limit warping due to the contraction of the lamination glue. The outcome of this highly regulated and predetermined production was a series of 52 by 52 centimetres tessellating relief blocks, each delineating different layers in the reduction process. And then it stopped again. In March 2020, Norway went into lockdown. The arrival of COVID-19 temporarily closed all institutions, schools and businesses. My hands were once again delegated to performing repetitive acts of childcare and domestic chores. In addition to fulfilling my teaching responsibilities at Kia remotely. My belief in completing the research project again began to falter and the uncertainty of returning to the print studio became an all too familiar state of mind. Fortunately, it almost returned to the point at which it had stopped. And the workmanship of certainty was embodied by the digital knowledge that I used for post-production in the computer suite and for CNC routing in the workshop. Once Norway partially reopened, I also began to assimilate predetermined production into my strategy of trial and error back in the print studio. I continued to make decisions based on judgment, dexterity and care from within the printmaking process. I remained open to the level of risk that makes interpretation possible. But simultaneously, I referenced the colour swatches appropriated from Monk's death in a sick room to remix multiple relief blocks. It became essential to record my progressive colour mixing as handwritten recipes, instructions, charts, and observations in a sketchbook. A strategy of third time lucky produced a polychromatic key print that referenced 20 colour swatches achieved by printing 10 layers with five multiple relief blocks. At the start of this research project, I had assumed that the number of colours would be limited by the same number of multiple relief blocks to achieve a continuous tessellation within the pre-planned timescale. But once I began referencing recorded data in my sketchbook to predetermine the colour mixing, gradient rolls and sequence of block printing, this led to unexplored terrain in my art practice. By mapping out and scaling up the key print, the methodology revealed a new approach to color printing that amplified the perception of flux and diversity across a large scale tessellated backdrop. My artistic re research incorporated knowledge gained from fieldwork exploring historical European hand printed wall coverings, including Zuber's visual aesthetic, William Morris half drop repeat, and Joseph Frank's multi block rotation. The outcome of the art production was exhibited in October 2020 at the Kunstschollen in Oslo. And in 2021 at the International Print Triennale in Krakow, as a video iteration at Impact in Hong Kong, and a billboard iteration at Onboards Biennale in Antwerp. My artistic research demonstrates how highly regulated and predetermined art production compensated for the loss of self confidence due to unforeseen time constraints on my artistic practice. The digital embodiment of tacit knowledge in the human computer interactions program the machine tools to mimic the hand carved matrix. The body itself is only human by virtue of technology. The human hand is human because of what it makes, not of what it is. What is human is the gesture of externalization, which is not from some pre-existing interior like thoughts in the brain, but is a gesture that constitutes a new sense of interior. The human is always being invented as such by the gestures that transform it. Brain, body and artifact cannot be separated. Thinking only occurs in the intermingling between them. Craftsmanship can be learned very slowly by practice through daily repetitive hand-eye exercise 
and dedicated time to develop tacit knowledge. It is not uncommon for artists to stop, to lose momentum or confidence in their artistic practice. Everyday factors like mental or physical health, financial insecurity, work and family commitments, and even global pandemics can impact on time for art production. However, art production determined by the care, judgment and dexterity of the artist's hand and machine tools remains distinct from contemporary digital tools. Perhaps as Adam Adamson argued, this is due to craft masking a somewhat romantic attitude to Pi's own historical moment. For myself, as an artistic researcher, the outcome of integrating digital technology into the printmaking process released my methodology from the, the embodied limitations of time, scale, and capacity. In addition, by assimilating pre-recorded colour mixing with tacit knowledge in colour printing, a strategy of third time lucky generated a level of complexity in my polychromatic printing that demands further exploration in the future. I would like to finish my presentation with a short video summarizing the project that uh, I'm going to, it's just three minutes that uh, I will leave you with just as a, a recap on some of the points that I covered. Um, and I'm just going to end on this information as a follow up. Um, you can read the uh, peer reviewed article online at the Impact Printmaking website. And I'll also be delivering a lecture as a follow up to this research in September during the Impact Conference that you are more than welcome to join us. And I think it's also available to watch online for those of you who aren't able to um, travel to the UK. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Wow.
Wonderful. Thank you, Victoria, so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to listen and to watch. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, that there are many students that will have uh, some, um, some questions. Uh, and if they don't, they will have it when, uh, when we see them in the studios. Uh, it was very, very nice. And I don't know if you have some time and if you were planning oh. to do some Q&A, if uh, oh, anyone yeah. has questions, please put on your microphone and feel free to, to say something. It's nice to anyone? see some faces, even if there's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe it would be nice to see everyone. It's, sort of, it's odd how when you then deliver the lecture, because in a sense, the lecture yeah. is the summary of everything that's gone previously. And of course, a lecture sounds very coherent, as if it was all planned. And it's quite meditative. It's become even more meditative because I'm looking at a screen and there's no one. <laughs> Yeah, please, so, please show up, everyone. <laughs> let's give everyone, let's give uh, uh, an applause to uh, to Victoria for her wonderful lecture. Oh, look, there's two for the price of one on that screen. <laughs> 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 okay, Victoria, can I can I ask a question? What's what part of your process do you love the most what is the thing that 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 keeps you going hmm. um well i think i'm always comparing myself unfortunately as artists do to our um other art artists you know colleagues and uh and where do we get our motivation from and our drive and i think i've learned over the years that i have always been drawn to research but it has only really been in the last 20 years that research has been a recognized established part of uh, our teaching delivery as it were because we had a first tier second tier and third tier so I never intentionally went out to engage with uh, art education I was a freelance artist in London uh, and through my printmaking, I was also working with artist books. Then I started representing other artists because I seemed to have more experience from uh, the Erasmus exchanges that I'd done in Marseille and in Bergen, reaching out, finding uh, what was out, what was going on in artist books. But of course, there was also the materiality of the work, and and I think. What's really, what you're hearing, what I've delivered today is not just a summary of the project, but is perhaps a summary of having the language to explain how I work and how I've worked for some time, but phrases like tacit knowledge, uh, the matrix, the materiality of the process and the, and the techniques that we work with. I didn't have that language previously. It was very intuitive. So I tend to work through um, questions that I challenge myself with and then see how that works through in the studio rather than perhaps, you know, how the audience might perceive a printmaker artist as in it's all about the additioning. As you can see, the work that I'm delivering, if anything, was the antithesis of that. It was very much about how can I explore my practice through the process of printmaking rather than the, in the repetition of the components. So mm -hmm. I've been long-winded, but I hope that helps. <laughs> and, and in which way is um, the final image, the output that you've made, um, in which way is it chosen in, 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 in relation to the, to, to the research? Or is it a, a standalone object that you say, okay, I want to make an image like this, and I'm going to apply the research for this part or? No, I mean, when in research, you start with questions. And of course, you have the confidence of your practice. There's a visual language of your practice that's going to predetermine, I think, very much the, uh, uh, the expression. But as you could see in what I was demonstrating, there's a lot of trial and error that's going on. And that takes a lot of time, I think, in a, in a printmaking craft process. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, 
that uh, again it's the uh, it's looking at the stereotype you know people assume that you're you're a printmaker so you work really quickly and that you work to editions because it's about the multiple and actually what I'm demonstrating here is that I'm failing a lot I, I wish I had the momentum to be in the studio every day, but I don't. So how can I continue working? And it's the question and the time scale of the research that really helps because I have a time scale in which to deliver the research. And I think there's more places now to disseminate research than there were 20 years ago. So there's a lot more um, you know, online publishing, for example, to publish articles. There's a lot more exchange between knowledge. And I get really excited about, I mean, the bit that I haven't shown you about, the next, these, a lot of this, you know, I mentioned the phrase iteration. So perhaps the editioning comes from different iterations. So it was great that when uh, this call out for Antwerp for the onboards, that was perfect timing for me because that was, I'd never experienced this and I hadn't planned it to be a billboard. What, what does that do to the work when it's placed in a public sphere in a sort of advertising in, in environment, and which is very much removed from perhaps where I'm getting a lot of my uh, reference points, which would be domestic wallpaper processes, where it started from. But what I'm doing at the moment, I'm now the next stage of the research is I'm working with the factory in the UK. I'm carving the blocks so that they will hand print in the same way that Zuba and Morris printed the blocks by hand. So it's a very simple press. You know, it's, it's, the, it's like it's gone from CNC routing, the digital knowledge, to be able to mimic the hand blocks that were carved by hand in the 19th century. And of course, I have a much greater appreciation now for those blocks, for the matrices, because I understand the relevance of pear wood, for example, why that was used and the work involved in making these matrices is a, is a work of art in itself. So that you could say is coming from known knowledge and sort of revealing that knowledge, but the images and my practice, I hope in the long run, of course, will reveal original works and original ways of working. And that's still sort of the unknown because that's that comes out through other avenues, I think. Thank you very much. And I uh, do appreciate uh, your, your uh, lecture. And I thank you very much for, uh, for the talk. Well, thank you for thank taking you. the time in your evening. So no, no problem. Pleasure. Yeah, I, I would also like to thank you one more time and uh, as well to uh, to say it was wonderful to have you also for the onboards biennial of course uh, in the billboard uh, and i had one uh, last question actually for you um the the imagery that you used uh, the uh, the nature in in mm. this case um mm. why do you start from there or um, why, why do you choose? Going way imagery? back, actually, I think the first, these motifs began when I was in Belgium, when I was at the Franz Maseril. And I was always very taken by the flatness of the land. And I had this sort of, uh, this theory, because you'd walk around, um, oh gosh, what's the, uh, the, um, the village? God, I can't remember the village. I've been there like three times now. And there's all this amazing sort of domestic topiary against this flat land. You're talking and, about Casterly. Uh, yeah, in Casterly, yeah. thank you, in Casterly. And I was really taken by the, the effort, the domestic effort to break from this flat horizon, I think, that these sort of topiary. And it got me thinking about the idea of, you know, I, I mean, very much we at the moment, you know, the thematics here at the Kunza Scholar, we talk a lot about the Anthropocene, that's very much what's going on about giving agency to objects and nature. Um, but what I keep coming back to in my own roots, in the universality of, for example, how we attempt to control the uncontrollable and the impact that's had. So the man-made impact that come, sort of there's a humor with the topiary and there's a universality as well, you know, across the world, you can see different forms of topiary. But then, of course, coming here to Oslo, and there is the domestic suburban environment, 
And it's used like any other place. It's these boundaries of sort of uh, cutting and dividing and trying to control people's space and environment. And um, it makes me laugh sometimes, you know, I think that's, sort of, I need that sort of humor. So there's a, there is a beauty to it, but I think the uh, attraction for me is the absurdity. Um, and uh, this has been a really dense research project. So I've been using the same image much longer than I ever planned because the image in a sense came from this, uh, these walls of, you know, they're unpopular. They have terrible reputations, these conifer trees uh, that, that create sort of dele delineation between uh, suburban spaces. But, uh, you know, you think of Norway and the, the, the romantic view of Norway and mountains and forests and nature, but actually their nature is just as man-made as uh, their domestic environment. It's just uh, the trees are planted earlier. There's actually, you know, when it comes to the natural terrain, it's amazing how much has been imported and, and uh, constructed in an unnatural way. So that's sort of like a, a theme that has con continued, has been going on now for the last sort of 10 years in my practice, but this sort of uh, challenge to repeat the the motif that was new for me and a real challenge I had no idea how I was going to do it and I thought I was relying on the software and as I explained actually the image was too complex the hand carved image was too complex for the software to be able to interpret to tessellate so again I through trial and error I had to do that by hand um, which makes me feel like I'm not really that much far removed from a a 19th century hand carving the matrix. But I, I you know, I don't know if anybody um, in the, 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 the print that I showed of the, uh, the women um, carving and printing the Japanese wood blocks, you know, that image was not an image of women hand carving and printing. It was a, it was a, it was a play on, beautiful Japanese women within the, the image to attract people to this image. But they were demonstrating different forms of wood carving and block printing. And what it obviously shows is that there's a team of people doing this process. But I, as a printmaker, sort of have forgotten that actually I'm doing all of this myself. I'm carving the block, I'm printing the work, so I only have one pair of hands. So I need, you know, I think it's important to have the confidence to say, yeah, this is how a digital tool can help me and support me in that development. Or this is how I can reach out to a factory. And so the factory are going to be printing the blocks. So that's going to be me, no hands. So true, so yeah. true. <laughs> I love that. So. I yeah. So true, and you are also the artist beside all these uh, other things. Uh, yeah, and but, a lot of uh, other artists get to yeah. sign their prints, and they actually have no interaction with the process because they go to the editioning print studio, and the editioners print the work for them. So I think there's a there's a lot of pressure, and and then of course to add into the mix having a child and just seeing how much time that actually took out of my practice and it was a proper stop. And it helped me also to reflect on some of the students that I've worked with, you know, mental health issues is not uncommon here in Norway. And then with COVID, it has been, you know, really stressful. And there's been a lot of anxiety for students to get through their BAs and their MAs. So I was hoping that this sort of delivery and un, perhaps an unusual way of delivering research as well because the peer review is all a bit like whoa this is a bit broad like is it about you know the time you know your sort of like a diary of how you make the work or is it about the process or is it about and I was trying to deliver something a bit more holistic to say you can't separate one from the other and sometimes you just have to stop and it's incredibly frustrating so how do you motivate yourself to continue. 
so true so true <laughs> i agree with you and i love the trial and error uh, that you have been mentioning all the time it's a very very necessary part uh, of of uh, success and um, yeah if there are no more questions um maybe we can uh, round it uh, up and i have a small uh, question um yes. can you hear me or not yes, yes. Oh, good. okay um just <laughs> i was wondering after your research because you have like a finished date for it um will you be completely letting it go and not work with the image anymore or will you always have this feeling because you've tried it so many times will you like always have the feeling oh, i can try it one more time or do it like this or do you have in your head no i'm gonna stop after yeah. the date i mean that's a good question and i think it's about how you envisage what artistic research is so the research itself isn't the motif the research are the questions that i've asked myself and of course, what's come out of what tends to happen in research, you answer those questions, but by answering those questions, other questions then materialize. So one of them, one of the next things was about, well, I'm working with linoleum, for example, because it's very easy to carve into. And then I translated that directly with the CNC router. Now they hadn't routed onto linoleum. We didn't know if it was going to work, but in the sort of bluntness of taking the hand to the machine, we attempted it and it worked. But it did then ask the question of, well, what other materials could I be working with on the CNC router? And then it helps me to think about the, um, you know, where is this material come from, the sustainability of it. We look a lot now in print. I think, for, you know, when I was a student, it be, people began to look at the health and safety of the printmaker. So we were looking a lot about solvents and the replacement of solvents. Now we're looking more about the sustainability of the materials that we work with. Now, lilonium is actually a fantastic material. It's antimicrobial. That's why they use it in hospitals. It actually reduces the amount of bacteria. So that is a, just by luck more than anything, I think is a, a material that we'll, we will keep making, that's gonna be around for a long time, but it does have its material limitations. It's soft. And although it, was, it lasted better than I initially thought it was going to, the blocks that I've accessed, uh, the William Morris blocks and the Zuba blocks, they're over 150 years old and they're still printing with them. So, you know, you've got, it completely reframes your practice because you suddenly you realize, hang on a moment, these blocks have probably lasted longer than the prints. You know, and that wasn't the plan. So where's the archive of blocks and matrices? You know, you can go to a print archive in a museum, but where are the archives of the matrices? So I st now what we're doing at the moment is comparing cherry wood, uh, birch, uh, beech wood, I can't access and don't want to access pear wood, but that was the original wood. And so rather than starting from scratch with the image, yes, I'm basically working with the same motif, but we're now investigating the matrix itself, the material out of the matrix. So that's the next set of research questions. And how I work, this isn't a PhD project, but perhaps the time frame feels like it because I my research is sort of, they're usually about uh, this. Well, they're supposed to be about a one year, 18 month project. But as I mentioned in COVID, it really sort of dragged out. I think that's that helps. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Do you have a PhD um, program where you're at? Is there a PhD program at uh, the Royal Academy of Yes, we do so, have a, a PhD program. Um, um, it's quite limited uh, because we still are in conjunction with the university, but we, we, we do have, and, and more and more people are doing this PhD yeah. research. Uh, but again, it's limited in, in size. We yeah. don't have too much people there. Exactly. I mean, we're under the Department of Art and Craft, so that was another thing that about my research that allowed me to 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 talk about craft where like in the uk talking about craft pre 
2000 was a dirty word, you know, it was seen as non-art. Um, but now the Academy is constantly knocking on our door, wanting to access our workshops because of the materiality of the processes that we work with. But we do share our department with textile, ceramics and metal, but it helps us to open, keep the conversation open to the materiality of the processes that we work with, rather than focusing perhaps in a very sort of microscopic way on a specific printmaking process. Um, mm -hmm. But they're changing the, um, they're rewriting the European, uh, I can't remember just the, the you know, what, what are the sort of definition of research is uh, under the European rules, they're rewriting to include artistic research this year. So I really think there's going to be, you know, uh, even more in the next 10 years, an understanding of the relevance of artistic research for... Yeah, well, the thing about that is it's about politics a little bit in, in, in a way that, of course, um, there is a con uh, concurrence, um, how you say, competition between all these research elements and um, artistic research is for us a very important thing. It's still in university, is a little bit misunderstood, especially in the output, which has to be written, which has to be like um, yeah. scientific in a way. Okay. And of course, Ideally. our our output is 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 uh, intuitive and 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 sometimes very interpretative and and that sort of thing just doesn't fit into their frame so that's mm. uh, one of these things yeah that i mean i certainly think there's uh, avenues of, of artistic research that go right over my head or it just doesn't speak to me so i mean i studied uh, my mfa at the center for print research in bristol um, and it was about four years ago that they gained some uh, funding from the uh, from the government for a, a new wing, a new department. And so they've really galvanized on the impact conference. And I think that's something that we don't want to take for granted because we really benefit from a conference for printmaking that doesn't have to be under the, you know, the artistic research conferences that can be very broad. I think, and much more based in the humanities than mm. in the tacit knowledge. Um, so, and then of course, there's something similar in uh, in America. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was one of the reasons I I took on this role here at in Oslo intentionally, so that I had the time. I would never have had the time to sit and write such a dense description of what actually I'm sure many of you work in a very similar way, but you know, it's very, not all of us have, have the time to be able to write uh, about what and we're it's, doing. It's never been taught to us as neither. So in a way that's a disadvantage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm learning on the job. No, it's true, <laughs> I've had to learn on the job. In fact, I went to a, a writing uh, course. They were doing a writing course at Oslo Met for the PhD students. So I went on that course while I was writing this uh, article. So please, I don't want you to think that I just write something like this and spout it off. No, this is a, an article. It, I wrote it, sent it to be peer reviewed. The whole process took about nine months. But the difference now is that when I give a lecture, then I can deliver more visuals perhaps than uh, the article. And therefore it gives more I think uh, tacit, direct. So don't worry about the words. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it's like reading it in different ways, isn't it? You can just sit and look, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, phrases like tacit knowledge and uh, the intersectionality, things like that. It works. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, fifteen years ago, when we started as well, our artistic research was that uh, a lot of uh, artists uh, did believe that they had their already done their artistic research by using visual elements and visual sure. uh, things, and uh, to to have to adapt to a written situation was quite hard for them, and uh, so they pr they were quite protective about it. Now. Yeah. A lot of people do it. A lot of young uh, teachers and, and and students who uh, are are doing uh, uh, this research, but 
it still is quite difficult to to have a registration to have an archive to have um what if you make an exhibition how are you going to keep on doing that is it going to be like a visual catalog or something else that's mm. that's mm. the big problem at the moment mm. well it's well i would encourage because i i'm aware of time and i'm sure everybody has it but i i would really encourage you to um look out for this impact 12 um, I think there's a lot of people delivering just short reflective presentations, like 10 minute reflective presentations on what they're up to. And they're doing it hybrid because of COVID, which I think really helps for those of us who, you know, that haven't got the time to give you know, five days to sit in a conference and sit in lots of lectures that don't necessarily relate to what we do. And it's very affordable as well to just be able to dip into the things online. So we're really pleased with that for us, I think, at the moment, just because it engages our students more. I think before it felt very much like at the sort of professorship level. It's true. Okay, thank you very much already. Sanya, are you? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Peter, uh, for your input. And thank you, Victoria, and uh, all of you. Um, listening to this lecture i hope uh, it was uh, valuable and i hope to see you next time so uh, have a very nice evening and uh, thank you all again <laughs>